According to the way it is generally used today, the term ethics relates above all to the domain of human rights, the rights of man, or, by derivation, the rights of living beings. We are supposed to assume the existence of a universally recognizable human subject possessing rights that are in some sense natural, the right to live, to avoid abuse of treatment, to enjoy fundamental liberties, of opinion, of expression, of democratic choice in the election of governments, etc. These rights are held to be self-evident, and the result of a wide consensus. Ethics is a matter of busying ourselves with these rights, of making sure that they are respected. This return to the old doctrine of the natural rights of man is obviously linked to the collapse of revolutionary Marxism, and of all the forms of progressive engagement that it inspired. In the political domain, deprived of any collective political landmark, stripped of any notion of the meaning of history and no longer able to hope for or expect a social revolution, many intellectuals, along with much of public opinion, have been won over to the logic of a capitalist economy and a parliamentary democracy. In the domain of philosophy, they have rediscovered the virtues of that ideology constantly defended by their former opponents, humanitarian individualism and the liberal defense of rights against the constraints imposed by organized political engagement. Rather than seek out the terms of a new politics of collective liberation, they have, in some, adopted as their own the principles of the established Western order. In so doing, they have inspired a violently reactionary movement against all that was thought and proposed in the 1960s. By the death of man? In those years, Michel Foucault outraged his readers with the declaration that man, in the sense of constituent subject, was a constructed historical concept peculiar to a certain order of discourse, and not a timelessly self-evident principle capable of founding human rights or a universal ethics. He announced the end of this concept's relevance, once the kind of discourse which alone had made it meaningful became historically obsolete. Likewise, Louis Althusser declared that history was not, as Hegel had thought, the absolute development devonier of spirit, nor the advent of a subject substance, but a rational, regulated process which he called a process without a subject, and which could be grasped only through a particular science, the science of historical materialism. It followed that the humanism of human rights and ethics in the abstract sense were merely imaginary constructions, ideologies, and that we should develop, rather, what he called a theoretical anti-humanism. At the same time, Jacques Lacan strove to disentangle psychoanalysis from all its psychological and normative tendencies. He demonstrated how it was essential to distinguish the ego, a figure of only imaginary unity, from the subject. He showed that the subject had no substance, no nature, being a function both of the contingent laws of language and of the always singular history of objects of desire. It followed that any notion of analytic treatment as a means for the reinstatement of a normal kind of desire was a fraud, and that, more generally, there existed no norm that could ground the idea of a human subject, a norm whose rights and duties it would have been the task of philosophy to articulate. What was contested in this way was the idea of a natural or spiritual identity of man, and with it, as a consequence, the very foundation of an ethical doctrine in today's sense of the word, a consensual lawmaking concerning human beings in general, their needs, their lives, and their deaths, and, by extension, the self-evident, universal demarcation of evil, of what is incompatible with the human essence. Is this to say, then, that Foucault, Althusser and Lacan extol an acceptance of the status quo, a kind of cynicism, an indifference to what people suffer? Thanks to a paradox which we will explain in what follows, the truth is exactly the opposite, all three were, each in his own way, and far more than those who uphold the cause of ethics and human rights today, the attentive and courageous militants of a cause. Michel Foucault, for example, maintained a particularly rigorous commitment engagement to a revision of the status of prisoners, and devoted to this question much of his time and the whole of his immense talent as an organizer and an agitator. Althusser's sole purpose was to redefine a genuinely emancipatory politics. Lincoln himself, beyond the fact that he was a total clinical analyst who spent the best part of his life listening to people, conceived of his struggle against the normative orientation of American psychoanalysis, and the degrading subordination of thought to the American way of life, as a decisive commitment engagement. For Lincoln, questions of organization and polemic were always of a piece with questions of theory. When those who uphold the contemporary ideology of ethics tell us that the return to man and his rights has delivered us from the fatal abstractions inspired by the ideologies of the past, they have some nerve. I would be delighted to see today so constant an attention paid to concrete situations, so sustained and so patient a concern for the real alley real, so much time devoted to an activist inquiry into the situation of the most varied kinds of people, often the furthest removed, it might seem, from the normal environment of intellectuals, as that we witnessed in the years between 1965 and 1980. In reality, there is no lack of proof for the fact that the thematics of the death of man are compatible with rebellion, a radical dissatisfaction with the established order, and a fully committed engagement in the real of situations stands alley real to situations, while by contrast, the theme of ethics and of human rights is compatible with the self-satisfied egoism of the affluent West, with advertising and with service rendered to the powers that be. Such are the facts. To elucidate these facts, we must examine the foundations of today's ethical orientation. To the foundations of the ethic of human rights. The explicit reference of this orientation, in the corpus of classical philosophy, is Kant. Our contemporary moment is defined by an immense return to Kant. In truth, the variety and the detail of this return are labyrinthine in their complexity, here I will concern myself only with the average version of the doctrine. What essentially is retained from Kant, or from an image of Kant, or, better still, from theorists of natural law, is the idea that there exist formally representable imperative demands that are to be subjected neither to empirical considerations nor to the examination of situations, that these imperatives apply to cases of offense, of crime, of evil, that these imperatives must be punished by national and international law, that, as a result, governments are obliged to include them in their legislation, and to accept the full legal range of their implications, that if they do not, we are justified in forcing their compliance, the right to humanitarian interference, or to legal interference. Ethics is conceived here both as an a priori ability to discern evil, for according to the modern usage of ethics, evil, or the negative, is primary, we presume a consensus regarding what is barbarian, and as the ultimate principle of judgment, in particular political judgment, good is what intervenes visibly against an evil that is identifiable a priori. Law droid itself is first of all law against evil. If the rule of law ita droid is obligatory, that is because it alone authorizes a space for the identification of evil, this is the freedom of opinion which, in the ethical vision, is first and foremost the freedom to designate evil, and provides the means of arbitration when the issue is not clear, the apparatus of judicial precautions. The presuppositions of this cluster of convictions are clear, 
1. We posit a general human subject, such that whatever evil befalls him is universally identifiable, even if this universality often goes by the altogether paradoxical name of public opinion, such that the subject is both, on the one hand, a passive, pathetic pathetic, or reflexive subject, he who suffers, and, on the other, the active, determining subject of judgment, he who, in identifying suffering, knows that it must be stopped by all available means. 2. Politics is subordinated to ethics, to the single perspective that really matters in this conception of things, the sympathetic and indignant judgment of the spectator of the circumstances. 3. Evil is that from which the good is derived, not the other way round. 4. Human rights are rights to non-evil, rights not to be offended are mistreated with respect to one's life, the horrors of murder and execution, one's body, the horrors of torture, cruelty and famine, or one's cultural identity, the horrors of the humiliation of women, of minorities, etc. The power of this doctrine rests, at first glance, in its self-evidence. Indeed, we know from experience that suffering is highly visible. The 18th century theoreticians had already made pity. Identification with the suffering of a living being, the mainspring of the relation with the other. That political leaders are discredited chiefly by their corruption, indifference, or cruelty was a fact already noted by the Greek theorists of tyranny. That it is easier to establish consensus regarding what is evil rather than regarding what is good is a fact already established by the experience of the church, it was always easier for church leaders to indicate what was forbidden, indeed, to content themselves with such abstinences, than to try to figure out what should be done. It is certainly true, moreover, that every politics worthy of the name finds its point of departure in the way people represent their lives and rights. It might seem, then, that we have here a body of self-evident principles capable of cementing a global consensus, and of imposing themselves strongly. Yet we must insist that it is not so, that this ethics is inconsistent, and that the, perfectly obvious, reality of the situation is characterized in fact by the unrestrained pursuit of self-interest, the disappearance or extreme fragility of emancipatory politics, the multiplication of ethnic conflicts, and the universality of unbridled competition. 3. Man, living animal or immortal singularity. The heart of the question concerns the presumption of a universal human subject, capable of reducing ethical issues to matters of human rights and humanitarian actions. We have seen that ethics subordinates the identification of the subject to the universal recognition of the evil that is done to him. Ethics thus defines man as a victim. It will be objected, no. You are forgetting the active subject, the one that intervenes against barbarism. So let us be precise, man is the being who is capable of recognizing himself as a victim. It is this definition that we must proclaim unacceptable, for three reasons in particular. One in the first place, because the status of victim, of suffering beast, of emaciated, dying body, equates man with his animal substructure, it reduces him to the level of a living organism pure and simple, life being, as Bisha says, nothing other than the set of functions that resist death. To be sure, humanity is an animal species. It is mortal and predatory. But neither of these attributes can distinguish humanity within the world of the living. In his role as executioner, man is an animal abjection, but we must have the courage to add that in his role as victim, he is generally worth little more. The stories told by survivors of torture forcefully underline the point, if the torturers and bureaucrats of the dungeons and the camps are able to treat their victims like animals destined for the slaughterhouse, with whom they themselves, the well-nourished criminals, have nothing in common, it is because the victims have indeed become such animals. What had to be done for this to happen has indeed been done. That some nevertheless remain human beings, and testify to that effect, is a confirmed fact. But this is always achieved precisely through enormous effort, an effort acknowledged by witnesses, in whom it excites a radiant recognition, as an almost incomprehensible resistance on the part of that which, in them, does not coincide with the identity of victim. This is where we are to find man, if we are determined to think him Eli Penzer, in what ensures, as Varlam Shalamov puts in his stories of life in the camps, that we are dealing with an animal whose resistance, unlike that of a horse, lies not in his fragile body but in his stubborn determination to remain what he is, that is to say, precisely something other than a victim, other than a being for death, and thus, something other than a mortal being. An immortal, this is what the worst situations that can be inflicted upon man show him to be, insofar as he distinguishes himself within the varied and rapacious flux of life. In order to think any aspect of man, we must begin from this principle. So if rights of man exist, they are surely not rights of life against death, or rights of survival against misery. They are the rights of the immortal, affirmed in their own right, or the rights of the infinite, exercised over the contingency of suffering and death. The fact that in the end we all die, that only dust remains, in no way alters man's identity as immortal at the instant in which he affirms himself as someone who runs counter to the temptation of wanting to be an animal to which circumstances may expose him. And we know that every human being is capable of being this immortal, unpredictably, be it in circumstances great or small, for truths important or secondary. In each case, subjectivation is immortal, and makes man beyond this there is only a biological species, a bit without feathers, whose charms are not obvious. If we do not set out from this point, which can be summarized, very simply, as the assertion that man thinks, that man is a tissue of truths, if we equate man with the simple reality of his living being, we are inevitably pushed to a conclusion quite opposite to the one that the principle of life seems to imply. For this living being is in reality contemptible, and he will indeed be held in contempt. Who can fail to see that in our humanitarian expeditions, interventions, embarkations of charitable legionnaires, the subject presumed to be universal is split? On the side of the victims, the haggard animal exposed on television screens. On the side of the benefactors, conscience and the imperative to intervene. And why does this splitting always assign the same roles to the same sides? Who cannot see that this ethics which rests on the misery of the world hides, behind its victim man, the good man, the white man? Since the barbarity of the situation is considered only in terms of human rights, whereas in fact we are always dealing with a political situation, one that calls for a political thought practice, one that is peopled by its own authentic actors, it is perceived, from the heights of our apparent civil peace, as the uncivilized that demands of the civilized a civilizing intervention. Every intervention in the name of a civilization requires an initial contempt for the situation as a whole, including its victims. And this is why the reign of ethics coincides, after decades of courageous critiques of colonialism and imperialism, with today's sordid self-satisfaction in the West, with the insistent argument according to which the misery of the third world is the result of its own incompetence, its own inanity, in short, of its subhumanity. 2. In the second place, because if the ethical consensus is founded on the recognition of evil, it follows that every effort to unite people around a positive idea of the good, let alone to identify man with projects of this kind, becomes in fact the real source of evil itself. Such is the accusation so often repeated over the last 15 years, every revolutionary project stigmatized as utopian turns, we are told, into totalitarian nightmare. Every will to inscribe an idea of justice or equality turns bad.
Every collective will to the good creates evil. This is sophistry and it's most devastating. For if our only agenda is an ethical engagement against an evil we recognize a priori, how are we to envisage any transformation of the way things are? From what source will man draw the strength to be the immortal that he is? What shall be the destiny of thought, since we know very well that it must be affirmative invention or nothing at all? In reality, the price paid by ethics is a stodgy conservatism. The ethical conception of man, besides the fact that its foundation is either biological, images of victims, or western, the self-satisfaction of the armed benefactor, prohibits every broad, positive vision of possibilities. What is wanted here, what ethics legitimates, is in fact the conservation by the so-called west of what it possesses. It is squarely astride these possessions, material possessions, but also possession of its own being, that ethics determines evil to be, in a certain sense, simply that which it does not own and enjoy C.E.K.N.S. Posse don't el jauer. But man, as immortal, is sustained by the incalculable and the unpossessed. He is sustained by non-being non-atent. To forbid him to imagine the good, to devote his collective powers to it, to work towards the realization of unknown possibilities, to think what might be in terms that break radically with what is, is quite simply to forbid him humanity as such. 3. Finally, thanks to its negative and a priori determination of evil ethics prevents itself from thinking the singularity of situations as such, which is the obligatory starting point of all properly human action. Thus, for instance, the doctor 1 over 2 ethical ideology will ponder, in meetings and commissions, all sorts of considerations regarding the sick, conceived of in exactly the same way as the partisan of human rights conceives of the indistinct crowd of victims, the human totality of subhuman entities reels. But the same doctor will have no difficulty in accepting the fact that this particular person is not treated at the hospital, and accorded all necessary measures, because he or she is without legal residency papers, or not a contributor to social security. Once again, collective responsibility demands it. What is erased in the process is the fact that there is only one medical situation, the clinical situation, and there is no need for an ethics, but only for a clear vision of the situation, to understand that in these circumstances a doctor is a doctor only if he deals with the situation according to the rule of maximum possibility, to treat this person who demands treatment of him, no intervention here, as thoroughly as he can, using everything he knows and with all the means at his disposal, without taking anything else into consideration. And if he is to be prevented from giving treatment because of the state budget, because of death rates or laws governing immigration, then let them send for the police. Even so, his strict Hippocratic duty would oblige him to resist them, with force if necessary. Ethical commissions and other ruminations on healthcare expenses or managerial responsibility, since they are radically exterior to the one situation that is genuinely medical, can in reality only prevent us from being faithful to it. For to be faithful to the situation means, to treat it right to the limit of the possible. Or, if you prefer, to draw from the situation, to the greatest possible extent, the affirmative humanity that it contains. Or again, to try to be the immortal of the situation. As a matter of fact, bureaucratic medicine that complies with ethical ideology depends on the sick conceived as vague victims or statistics, but is quickly overwhelmed by any urgent, singular situation of need. Hence the reduction of managed, responsible and ethical health care to the abject task of deciding which sick people the French medical system can treat and which others, because the budget and public opinion demand it, it must send away to die in the shanty towns of Kinshasa. For some principles. We must reject the ideological framework of ethics, and concede nothing to the negative and victimary definition of man. This framework equates man with a simple mortal animal, it is the symptom of a disturbing conservatism, and, because of its abstract, statistical generality, it prevents us from thinking the singularity of situations. I will advance three opposing theses. Thesis 1, man is to be identified by his affirmative thought, by singular truths of which he is capable, by the immortal which makes of him the most resilient, resistant and most paradoxical of animals. Thesis 2, it is from our positive capability for good, and thus from our boundary-breaking treatment of possibilities and our refusal of conservatism, including the conservation of being, that we are to identify evil, not vice versa. Thesis 3, all humanity has its root in the identification in thought and pensée of singular situations. There is no ethics in general. There are only, eventually, ethics of processes by which we treat the possibilities of a situation. At this point the refined man of ethics will object, murmuring, wrong. Wrong from the beginning. Ethics is in no sense founded on the identity of the subject, not even on his identity as recognized victim. From the beginning, ethics is the ethics of the other, it is the principle opening to the other, it subordinates identity to difference. Let us examine this line of argument. Does it contribute something new?